selected to be the chair for the knee preservation subcommittee. And as you are all aware, there are three domains of learning and they are knowledge, attitude, and skills. During the year, we will continue to work on this. And today's seminar will provide you the basic knowledge, which will help you change your attitude towards knee conservation, and which we'll follow in the second and third webinar by techniques of surgery. And in the last on 13th December, we'll have the pre-conference workshop. During course of the year, we'll be do giving lectures on demand, hands-on workshop, planning of osteotomy, saw bone exercises, and video presentation. You will be happy to know that we'll be doing a live demonstration in Kanpur as our first face-to-face <coughs> -face activity. All of you can join me, uh, reach to me so that we can help you plan activity in your area. The problem is quite large. We have 46 million patients who have the need to sit cross-legged in a spot on the floor. And unfortunately, we are quite low in the healthcare index. So we have to look for solutions which last lifetime for a patient and it should be provided early. The present situation is that we know as Indians, we are more tolerant to pain. Patients don't consult us till the pass is above three. This leads to advanced disease and inherently we advise surgery, we avoid surgery by habit and for financial reasons. And unfortunately, knee surgery is synonymous to knee replacement. And there are very few surgeons who do osteotomy around the knee. And thus the solution lies in teaching doctors and patients about knee conservation. A word of caution here, the industry is trying to propagate even UKA as a preserving surgery. And the other thing is that we have to understand the difference between various types of osteotomies. Open high, open wedge high table osteotomy is different than STO. It's a type of STO. But when we talk of a specifics, we must be clear what we are talking. And for this task, for the first webinar, we have Professor Mittal from All India Institute. He has keen interest in knee conservation. He'll be speaking on the, the his history of osteotomy. Then we have Dr. Sain. He's immediate past president of IOA. He is known for his pelvic estabular work, but he is very fond of knee conservation and his talk would give you new dimensions in the lifestyle modification and exercise to conserve the knee. Then we have Dr. Ajit Segal from Varanasi. He is a member of IOA Knee Preservation Committee and he'll be speaking on uh, intra-articular injections. What is the evidence? For against, we have Milind uh, from Gurgaon. Then we have Dr. Krishna Kumar. He will be speaking on the success story of STO. And in the end, we have Dr. Dinesh Thakkar from Ahmedabad who will tell us about what are the various types of osteotomies and to supervise and guide us through this, we have Dr. Mangal Parihar from Mumbai. And my own personal interest is, is only propagating knee preservation in India and in neighboring countries so that the joint replacement when it's not needed is not done. And then I request our president-elect Dr. Ram Chadha to give us a word of wisdom. Dr. Ram Chadha. Good evening, everybody. 
at the outset may i congratulate the ioa knee preservation subcommittee headed by dr sanjay rastogi and having very eminent contributors in dr dinesh thakkar dr ajit sagal and an advisor in dr mangal parihar for having got together stage 1 of what dr rastogi shared he said that there is knowledge there is attitude and there is skill what he meant is we have to use our head our heart and our hands he is going to address all three dimag dil or de in teeno ka istemal karenge that's the time that we will know which patient needs what the lord almighty created our entire anatomy to be preserved and as far as possible i repeat the words as far as possible we should try and preserve the creation of the creator so i thank you all to work towards what may not be techno savvy what may not be market driven but which comes from your heart and head and is executed by your hands so we are extremely happy that the ioa has this active subcommittee which is working towards propagating knee preservation not just in india but probably the entire indian subcontinent so all the best to all of you and i would be happy that my dear colleagues from the ioa who are with me dr navin thakkar and of course your panelists our immediate past president dr ramesh sen would enlighten us further and take us forward thank you very much and congratulations to the subcommittee thank you so much god bless you thank you dr chadha for your very kind words it means a lot to us and now i request dr ravi mittal to speak on review of literature what the literature says Can I share the screen? Yes. Doctor Nastogi, can I leave the? Hello. Thank you so very much, Doctor Naveen, for your presence. I am sure. you will look towards the cause for knee preservation in india <laughs> yes sir yes sir thank you very last much last year also yes. you contributed a lot for yes. a knee preservation with dinesh thakkar and all mangal paliyar and everybody has worked very hard right. as far as the knee preservation is concerned and you visited twice amdavad for knee preservation workshops and live surgery yes. and the uh, 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 the originator himself stobly came to demonstrate as the sto open way osteo so uh, i i i wish a great success to this webinar thank you and, so much uh, go ahead with the academics we do not do not want to waste much time okay thank, thank you. you thank you very much uh, good evening everybody uh, i thank uh, iwe for this invitation and i'll be talking about a review of literature uh, regarding the high tibial osteotomy the aim to review literature regarding sto is to prove its efficacy safety and good long term results and also to bust the myths and false propaganda around the high tibial osteotomy procedure now the first myth is that sto is a stop gap arrangement uh, ultimately it has to go for tkr strictly speaking yes it is a stop gap arrangement but this time gap is long enough when the procedure is done accurately and it is long enough to avoid tkr later in life even the uh, procedure of unicondylar replacement and total knee replacement do not last forever strictly speaking they are also stop gap arrangements for the patient but nobody asked this question for the knee replacement it is asked only for the high tibial osteotomy if you look at the literature uh, koshino came up with uh, the success of 97% at 7 years 
95 at 10 years, 86, uh, 87 at 15 years. Another report, uh, 97 success, 97 percent success, 10 years, 90 percent at 15 years. Another report, 94, 94 percent at five years, 80 percent at 10 years, 65 percent at 15 years, and 54 percent at 18 years. Another report, 65 to 74 percent at 10 years. So this procedure lasts quite long uh, to benefit the patient. This is a report which says that the survival rate of medial opening wedge high tibial astrotomy is 95% at 12 years after the procedure. The success rate of closed wedge HTO is 92.5% at 15 years. And the overall survival rates of HTO are 99% uh, at 5 years, 94% at 10 years, and 85 at 15 years. So that's a good survival rate. Another myth is that high tibial astrotomy is unsuitable for bone on bone lesion. But Koshino has shown that the HTO can be done for this procedure, this situation where there is bone on bone, which is also called a kissing lesion, and even the cartilage regenerates in the medial compartment, both on the tibial and the medial side. In this report, the authors have shown that high tibial astrotomy is a good option for osteoarthritis with kissing lesions. Kissing lesion is bone on bone lesions. And this report shows that the high tibial astrotomy is a good alternative to unicondylar replacement for medial compartment osteoarthritis accompanied by kissing lesions. Another uh, myth is that HTO is not suitable in old age, but literature has shown that the age of the patient does not have to be taken into consideration for the indication of HTO. This report in 2017 showed that the age did not influence the clinical and logical outcome after open wedge high tibial astrotomy, where the two groups of the patient were divided by age. Group one was A was more than 65 and group B was less than 65. The results were almost similar. Another report in 2019 that there was no significant difference in the survival rate after HTO between the two groups divided by the age. One group was less than 64 and other was more than 65. Another method is that high tibial astrotomy compromises future TKR. The answer is a big no. There is no difference between primary TKR and TKR after HTO. And there are multi -report, multiple reports to support that. In fact, a TKR is made easier when the virus deformity is corrected and you don't have to correct the deformity during the TKR. So I have uh, taken out few reports which show that the TKR after HTO has similar outcome as primary TKR and there is no negative influence of HTO on future TKR. The second report says that the HTO was not a determined for first worse results after TKR. The third report says that the, both the closed wedge and the open wedge had similar clinical radiological outcome after TKR, but there were some surgical issues after closed wedge TKR, uh, closed wedge HTO when the TKR was done in these cases. Some people say that bilateral HTO is not possible, like you do a bilateral knee replacement, but it has been shown that you can safely do a bilateral HTO. The only thing is that these patients might need a blood transfusion when you do a bilateral surgery. Another concern is that HTO can cause petalofemoral problems, but it has been shown that despite the petala infra in open wedge HTO, there is no clinical or radiological changes in the petalofemoral joint. Some people also said that the HTO is very unpredictable. You don't know who will benefit after HTO and who will not. So first of all, this premise is false. Other thing is that if you want to be sure, you can use a temporary unloading valgus producing knee brace. And if the patient benefits with this brace, then most likely the HTO will give you a good result. So you can be sure before doing a surgery. Another concern that was raised earlier in the uh, introduction was that the UKR is much better than HTO for medial compartment osteoarthritis. If you look at the literature, the early reports showed that the HTO was not, not inferior, but the later reports, which is more recent, show that the HTO is even better than the UKR. So let's see that. So this is in the Journal of Arthroplasty, a systematic review and meta-analysis. 
There is no difference in the functional result of the two procedures. There is no difference in the survival. On the contrary, HTO has better range of motion. Another report, general arthroplasty meta-analysis, no difference in the specific knee score between the two procedures, no difference in the complication and the rates of revision. On the contrary, range of motion is better in HTO. General arthroplasty meta-analysis, uh, they concluded that the correct patient selection with uh, correct patient selection, both HTO and UKR show effective and reliable results. Another report, general arthroplasty, that there is no difference between UKR and HTO in return to recreational activities and short-term clinical. Cochrane database again says there is no difference in the pain, function, and gait after the two procedures. This is a meta-analysis and systematic review, and it concluded that it, they were unable to conclude which method is superior, HTO or UKR. This report that there is no difference at 12 and 24 months between the UKR and HTO. The HTO has better correction of mechanical access and HTO is the treatment of choice for younger and active patients. Now, this is quite interesting. Uh, this report shows that the median time to return to previous professional occupation is shorter in HTO as compared to UKR. And the mean time to return to sports activities is again shorter in HTO as compared to UKR. So UKR scores in all the aspects over UKR. HTO scores better. Now, if you see a very recent report, uh, it, say, it looks at the rate of conversion to TKR after both the procedures. They found that the HTO was converted to TKR later than the UKR to TKR. So the survival of HTO was longer than that of UKR. Second point, the authors concluded that the HTO patients uh, use opioids for a shorter duration as compared to those of UKR. So you have a longer survivorship of HTO as compared to UKR as per this report. Now this is a report uh, which says that the TKR after HTO has a lower risk of revision than TKR after UKR. That means there is less failure of TKR in HTO than a TKR which is done after T uh, UKR. So the red line shows the survival of H TKR after HTO and the blue line shows the TKR after unicondylar replacement. So the survival of the red one, which is the TKR after HTO is much higher. Now, this is a very recent report where they compared two groups of patients, and these are all young active patients. They were not old and debilitated patients. In one group, they did a T HTO and then did a TKR when it failed. And in other group, they did a TKR as a primary procedure. So what they found was that the HTO, which is followed by TKR, had better survivorship than primary TKR in young patients. So the blue line shows the survivorship of HTO plus TKR and the red line shows the survivorship of primary TKR. So obviously there is a big difference between the two survivorship. So it concludes in other words that the, there is less failure of TKR after HTO than primary TKR in young patients. So to conclude, all myths have been busted and we conclude that the HTO is a reliable, predictable procedure with good long-term results. It is suitable even for bone-on-bone -bone lesions. So the myth which has been spread that HTO is not good for bone-on-bone -bone is false. Age is not a limiting factor. It does not cause petalofemoral problems. It does not compromise future TKR. Bilateral HTO can be done at the same setting and it scores over UKR in all the aspects. And the, these things can be returned to early function, survivorship and long-term function. And when you do TKR after HTO, it has a better survivorship than when you do a TKR after UKR. And TKR after HTO has better survivorship than primary TKR in young patients. So to conclude, HTO is a very good procedure and that can be a better solution for medial compartment osteoarthritis in all the age groups. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,
Professor Mittal, you have very convincingly conveyed the importance of STO. And if there are any questions, Can I ask a question, sir? Please. Uh, uh, in review of literature, Dr. Ravi Mittal uh, said that even after UK uh, sports is allowed, I am not aware about that. Sports. Uh, what you have stated in one statement. Return that, to sports, yes. Uh, but is it is it allowed after UKR? I don't know exactly. I don't know UKR, so I cannot say, but the literature uh, is commenting on this issue. Okay. Uh, this must be one study because everywhere they say if the patient has to be active, then UKR and TKR are both out. So any patient, irrespective of age, who want to be physically remain physically active, the only choice is doing a STO. If you talk to people who are doing UKR, they say yes, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, so whatever the literature says or the primary indication. And then so this, this is the literature that I have quoted. Yes. Because now, in if, you once has different type of studies. Now, recently you have also shown that article in which they say the UKA is a knee conservation surgery. So, so they, they, they don't they don't agree agree to call it to a partial replacement. So uh, it's only a promotional so you, gimmick. And we should not be taken away by their statements. See, if you look at the literary outcome, long-term outcome of uh, UKR, only the center which has developed the processes has got good results. Not everybody has got good results. If you look at the number of UKRs being done in UK, it is far, far less than the TKR. If the country of origin of UK uh, uh, is not doing UKR, then there must be something wrong with it. So yes. if a procedure is showing very good results only in the hands of its inventor or the patent holders, then you have to think uh, many times before advocating this procedure. You, you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. in, in Australia, the indications, the percentage of people who are offered UKR has, is gradually going down over the last 10 years. So now we move on to the, if there are no further questions, we move on to the next. And I will request Dr. Ramesh Sain to tell us about the role of lifestyle modification and exercise. And to my mind, this is the most important uh, aspect because if we advise patients these two things, then we can also delay uh, the STO procedure for quite some time. And this will ultimately help patient in his long uh, uh, life. So good evening, Sir. friends. And thank you, Dr. Sanjay. I mean, definitely you must speak what you practice. And frankly, for my uh, own profession, in my own practice, this is what I do, followed by HTO and then TKR. Somehow I don't do uni. So incidentally, when you say, uh, to talk about life cell modification, this is something which I keep on telling my patients as my first management. As you have given a data that this is one of the most common problem, we understand it. So when we look at the lifestyle, we need to look at it. What are the profile of these patients who get knee osteoarthritis? Same with the literature and which is all the latest literature available. Women are more important. We all know it from our clinical work also, but the statistical work also says the cause could be multifactorial. It's not only the gender, it could be hormonal, metabolic structure, but do they say that cartilage loss is higher rate in women? And that's what they say, that probably estrogen replacement may help in that scenario. Then look at the other perspective. So the title of the article is different, but the important thing which they have given is, if you look at the education of the patients, it is the low education people who have got more knee issues. Then obesity, we all understand why it is so. Type 2 diabetes have significantly more. And then sports and squatting and kneeling. These are the activities more likely to 
get in patients who are clinically symptomatic. A very common thing which is perceived by the people is the sports active that people are more likely to have. The literature has clearly defined it out that routine sports do not need lead to higher weight chances. It is only the soccer, long distance running, competitive weightlifting and wrestling where there is a high contact and high collision sports. These are which have been found to be linked with arthritis. Routine sports are not linked with the arthritis. Occupation. Yes. If you look at white collar job, they are least involved. If you look at the pink collar service and sales workers, they also don't have it. But blue collars like technician, machine operators or low-level laborers working in the agricultures are more likely to have knee symptomatology. So, one may combine many factors, but this is what the paper says about from the Korean studies. Again, another question is, is the diet? The only thing which they have found in the diet is alcohol. Alcohol as a factor, if it's, it is significantly related to the osteoarthritis. While the paper itself does say that high intake of full fat dairy and cheese is associated with lower chances of knee arthritis. What I am subsequently saying about this, most of these are from the recommendation, the guidelines. I am quoting less of the paperwork. I am quoting more from the guidelines because papers may be biased at many levels. The guidelines make a very uniformity in the opinions. So when we look at these, uh, there are some papers also where we have, I could not get specifically for dietary supplements, there is no significantly proven way that this is really good. Supplement, they say, may have some effect, but long-term follow-ups are not there and no clinically importance uh, has been given to dietary supplements as such. As far as management is concerned, they do say that we should reduce plasma cholesterol by dietary means. They do say that we should have more increase of three fatty acids, preferably by eating fish twice a week. We must have more vitamin K intake by eating green leafy vegetables. We must have safe level of vitamin D by having a better sun exposure. These are the things. The question comes, what about the vitamin D supplementation? Should it be a regular thing or? They do find it out. One of the papers have found it out. Yes, that is, there is a positive clinical effect on pain modification. But the results are still conflicting. You cannot really make a foolproof opinion. But what is clear and which doesn't require any evidence is the body weight role. Because we know that by when we are walking on a level ground also, at every step we are putting 1.5 times body weight on our each knee. And when we are going up and down, the load may become 2 to 3 times and 4 to 5 times during our squatting position. When we come to the lifestyle change, obviously the first change must be in the management of the weight. And it has been seen that even if we reduce 1 kg of weight, it will have quadruple reduction in the forces which are acting on the knee joint. And the symptomatology sometimes can be ameliorated if we are doing this weight loss primarily. These are the Singapore guidelines which say that if you have a patient whose body mass index is more than 25 kg per square meter, he must follow that weight reduction protocol. But if his body mass index is more than 30, it has to be a medically supervised weight reduction program for to be effective for the OA. As far as ORC guidelines are concerned, they say weight loss of 5% if achieved within 20 weeks period, meaning by 0.25% per week is efficacious. And whatever the level of osteoarthritis, whether it's mono joint, whether it's multiple joint, this is the most appropriate treatment. Again, an Another paper, 2019 guidelines, again say weight loss is strongly recommended. And any step up in the weight loss, whether it is 5 to 10% stage, 10 to 20%, will definitely have an effect on the body weight, including the exercise program. And now what are the exercises? The Cochrane review is very clear. And then you have an opinion from American Academy guidelines, ULR guidelines, ORC guidelines, that there is a benefit. It may be long term, it may be short term. But definitely the exercise schedules helps. As for lifestyle change, obviously exercise must be a part of it. That healthy weight maintenance exercises at least uh, every week are scheduled properly 
must be made in addition to whatever supplements we are taking. Again, this is a 60 trials. When they were making this paper, they took 60 trials of the 44 for knee, 2 for hip, and 41 mixed. And what they concluded? That there is sufficient evidence that significant benefit occurs from the exercise over no exercise. And exercises must be combined to have strength, flexibility, and aerobic capacity. A very common example of exercise people use is cycling. Yes, cycling is definitely recommended, performed site of exercise. And then there is a level of MICT protocol, moderate intensity continuous training or a high intensity uh, interval training. Both are important for uh, having an exercise. A very common thing in our Indian population is to know about yoga. Because the, tie, the way we sit in yoga, it is likely to produce a strain on the medial side. But what is said in the scientific paper is that if you have to do yoga, you can do. The only thing is you must have a reasonable amount of external rotation, not on the knee joint, but on the hip joint, which one can practice. And if it does that, there is not much strain over the knee joint. And then if you look at the benefit of that yoga, there are reasonable number of papers published, which they say it has got a positive effect on the knee issues and improve pain, knee symptom and strength can happen, all these studies say. The routine physical activity, the literature is very clear. Uh, activity which has got more than 10,000 steps is okay, but if it is less than 10,000, it is likely that OA can be accelerated, but not a very significant advance. But what they say, at least 45 minutes can improve or sustain normal functional activity in prevention of the lower extremity osteoarthritis. Whether the use of cane in that age group can help, yes, it can diminish pain and sometimes it can increase the ability. But same is not about crutches because our ORC guideline says they are very unclear whether the crutches should be given to a patient who is symptomatic or not. Braces, there is a controversy. There is a recommendation from Cochrane that it might increase the walking distance. But American Academy says we are unable to recommend for or against. The 2020 guidelines say they may have some kind of effect, but not much proof can be added to. A very simple thing is a foot. What is the kind of a shoe? And the recommendation is flexible soles, like flat walking soles, and with the, which put less stress, a flexible rubber sole. And they say this is appropriate. ORC guidelines says for every level of OA, this is an appropriate change. Our seniors very many times were advising a lateral wedge in sole in a way to reduce the pressure on the medial side. Incidentally, I had my own patient who came after a year with a follow-up when she showed her previous x-ray and the soul which she was using and the x-ray in the day of that day. So there was a significant improved with that kind of effect which surgery was to produce later on. But here, just that, I my query was what you did for the whole year that I kept on using these kind of a sleeper for whole of the year. So meaning by this mechanical alteration does have that kind of benefit if not in all, but at least some patients over there. Among the thermal interventions, yes, our guidelines suggest biothermy, ultrasound, hot and cold packs. Hot packs have little doubtful about a price, pass, massage, and they do feel it has got a beneficial effect. Some people, maybe the Cochrane Review says, some people may have some kind of a benefit, but overall, the evidence is not very high. A very simple things come topical in acids. If there is single joint involvement, with or without comorbidities, they are okay. They are safer. They are better. But question comes, which one is better? This is one study now, which says the declofenac is most effective for topical pain relief. And if you want to improve function, peroxicam, but avoid salicylates gels. So overall, when you are looking at osteoarthritis, the RC guidelines says topical are strongly recommended and it might take about 12 weeks for that to be effective, but we are happy that it doesn't have a lot of comorbidities. So when we overview the management, all these greens, meaning by exercise, weight loss, self-management program, tai chi, yoga, or cane and braces are all in green, meaning by they are strongly recommended. And there are some others, hand arthrosis, hand this, they are conditionally. And what is strongly against is something like 
tens also, and then there may be no recommendations for some. Then the question is, do the patients follow our guidelines? Whatever the guidelines are given, the literature, if you can look at that study, only 20% of the participants are using. Not very many people abide by what is said. And then the same paper further says, who are the people who are not likely to accept these lifestyle modifications are our older participants, patients who are not very well educated, who are less than post-secondary education, and females. These are the people who are not likely to understand the guidelines of so-called lifestyle modifications and likely to go. And what happens? Most of these patients actually end up in a replacement which is not appropriate. It has been found it out in the USA study that 26% of the TKR were performed when they had they were done prematurely. Either the patients were younger or they were living alone and they had economic necessities. So to sum up, the practice which is going on the, the, that the healthcare providers passively await the final joint and death so that they can do a replacement, that's not appropriate. We must appreciate osteoarthritis, a chronic condition where there is always a chance of a prevention and there are proper norms, the proper model which can follow. We understand that joint injury, obesity and impaired muscle functions are all modifiable things. They are all amenable to primary and secondary prevention strategies. So we must choose the right interventions which is acceptable to our specific patient to maximize the adherence and persistence with the region. Because now it is the time we must make an effort of personalized prevention of knee osteoarthritis. Thank you. Dr. Sanjay, you are muted, please. The way you convince uh, your patients, if there are any questions from Sir, the... I have a small doubt regarding this. Please. There are, there are a lot of patients uh, with osteoarthritis who come and ask us regarding the use of hot versus cold compresses in the knee. Of when to use the hot and when to use the cold compressor. Sir, your take on this, please. Yes, this is a very common question. I understand. I tell to the patients, each person is has got its, its own modality. You can try both. Mostly we have seen the cold is better, but have your own perception because you cannot have a generalized thing for A, B, C, D and everybody. Let him adjust with both, find it out which is good for him and use that. That's my practice. Um, right, sir. Thank you, sir. I strongly agree with this. The way I would do it, because the patient comes to you when there's an increase in pain of a short duration. So start with cold. He would be benefited if he says no. Then you can always tell him that you do what suits you better. Sir, another thing that I would like to ask, sir, is, Ramesh, sir, is, uh, regarding the use of braces, sir, there are a lot of patients who have an acute exacerbation of a chronic uh, pain in the knee. Uh, and uh, probably we take it as probably a degenerative meniscal tear or uh, a sudden aggravation because of an abrupt movement or a twisting movement or an uneven surface that the patient walks on. But uh, is uh, use of a brace actually helpful in uh, all the patients or do we have some uh, criteria to use these braces in selected patients? Yes, there are two things here. One is the question of acute exacerbations, and second is the braces. As for acute exacerbation, they can happen as you rightly said it out. Sometimes there will be mechanical tears happening in a degenerated joint. They need to be treated as an acute phase of a synovitis in an arthritic joint. This is likely to settle down with some days rest and telephometry and something like that. And then in my practice, I put them on a gradual physical therapy. The braces are specifically, I, I don't use them so often for two reasons. They are cumbersome to use and patients are never comfortable using them. And they are costly also for our population. If you are looking for a good brace, they are not very economic also. So I don't reasonably use it. There will be patients who will be coming with braces. I do ask them, are you comfortable with it? Who have been advised elsewhere also. Some patients do feel, but some patients say, Nay, ab ye chubta hai. this doesn't go very well with me. So personally, I'm not a fan of using braces, but I do see some patients see SKG, kuch fark pada hai, but I have not found in my own clinical practice a reasonable benefit out of it. 
One sir, question uh, about the same. Question, yes, sorry, sorry. One question, sir. So uh, you talked about, uh, you just now mentioned about braces. Does the long-term use of a brace affect the quadriceps power? Because quadriceps uh, power, once it is reduced, it's likely to increase the osteoarthritis, right? That, that exactly, I mean, the literature is very clear and I have shown you three different things. Cochrane Review, somewhere it says, American Academy says, we cannot say this way or that way. And other literature, I have not been able to find any guideline which says it should be used. They say it has got a variable effect depending upon the studies which have been conducted. Personally, I feel the quadriceps tendons are much more important than having a passive support in the form of a brace. So active work of the patient, if it is made, is much better. And if you are using a brace as a passive support, it will definitely enable. So what I tell to the patient that if you are comfortable, please get more exercise just like it for my back pain also if somebody is using a back pain belt i say now you have to do more exercises because this belt is taking away the active forces from your side making it passive so your activity must not be only to use a brace but to strength more that's that's my take one question dr sain please uh, what form of estrogen you use for the postmenopausal ladies in cases of the osteo osteoarthritis I, I, because I, I don't have that profile of patients coming to see, I do not use these uh, these things. I'm more into lifestyle. This is the literature which says I personally am not using that. So I don't know about the exact dose uh, these things. But I am careful about uh, exercises, lifestyle modifications of that part of it. As some of the some of the calcium preparation, preparation they are coming with the isoflavon. And they claim that it is a natural estrogen and that helps. It is just a claim by the yeah, company. Yes, yes. So uh, I want to, what is your practical experience no, for this? I only believe in guidelines which are clear. I don't have my practice based on studies. That, that's my take. Right. Thank you, Dr. Amir Singh. And we move on to the next. Uh, can I just put in a question? A quick question for Ramesh sir. Sir, is there any role of uh, electrotherapy in patients? Because there are a lot of patients who have written on their OPD prescriptions uh, by many physical therapists, as well as orthopedic surgeons, regarding the need of uh, settlement for acute uh, osteoarthritic events. They prescribe a uh, few uh, days to weeks of uh, uh, electrotherapy. Is it really advisable? Uh, I never advise them. Rather, many times the patients are not happy when I say change your physiotherapist. Because this is more a business, actually. They take away the patient. Somehow, I mean, physiotherapists are never happy with me because my force is always on good exercises as a management rather than these passive things which are coming up. They are more a placebos. And if you have seen that one of my last slides, what is contraindicated are all those things. The, the, I, 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 agree, Dr. Sen. I say to complete exam, self-study is more important than tuition. <laughs> that's the way I tell them so thank you very much thank now you, we thank you. move on to the next and that's by Dr. Ajit Sagan role of intraarticular injections we are running little late so we have to be on time Dr. Sagan okay Uh, the topic, uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjay, the chair of the Knee Preservation Committee. The topic allotted to me is the role of intraarticular injection evidence for. Uh, the intraarticular injections, they are given in form of the uh, cortisone, visco supplement, and PRP. Uh, cortisone can be given three times, but I have come across with the patient where physicians have given 30 injections in the knee joint, and the result was the Charcot's knee, as you can see. Then the PRP is the talk of town nowadays. What is the myth with PRP, whether it works or not, or how much it is effective? Coming to the history, it was firstly used in 1987 for an open heart surgery procedure for healing of the sternal wound. And then the begin of the gaining popularity in mid 90s. And now since has been, it has been applied to many different medical fields, such as cosmetic surgery, dentistry, sports medicine, 
pain management and osteo osteoarthritis uh, the platelet uh, pre preparation the prp pre preparation this is a normal process the blood is collected and then centrifuged and now it is platelet rich plasma is extracted from the tube and this is the centrifuge machine this is a, a photo activation machine uh, and it is said that when you activate the plasma with the photo activator machine it is less painful and the alpha granules they break fast and release the growth factors uh, coming to the point the single spin oblique double double spin prp the single spin prp produces a serum with a less concentration of the platelet and dual spin uh, spin it provides the approximately up to 6.7% times better activation it plays an important role whether done chemically or the photo activation after activation injection is less painful and degradation of the alpha granules occurs fast which releases the growth factors the composition of the prp as you all know these are the different uh, fact growth factors and other cytokines which include platelet derived growth factor transforming growth factors fibroblast growth factor fibroblast growth factor insulin like growth factor 1 and 2 vascular endothelial growth factor epidermal growth factor interleukin 8 keratocyte growth factor connective tissue growth factor these are all different growth factors from the alpha granules of the uh, prp and uh, they initiate the following stage and they do tissue necrosis resolution they do the chemotaxis cell regeneration cell proliferation and migration extracellular matrix synthesis remodeling angiogenesis and epithelialization uh, these are the different uh, growth factors this is the alpha granules which breaks and releases the growth factors these are the different grades of the uh, osteoarthritis grade 1 2 3 and 4 as you all know i don't have to, to describe it uh, then prp in uh, knee osteoarthritis one study was published in 2000 13 involved 78 patient with osteoarthritis in both knee and each knee received one of the three treatment option one prp injection second and one placebo saline injection researchers they evaluated the subject knee 6 weeks 3 months and 6 months after the injection and knee treated with one or two injection of the prp they showed a reduction in the pain stiffness as well as improvement in the knee function at 6 week and 3 months at the 6 month mark position results they declined though pain and function were still better than the before prp prp treatment the group that received the placebo injection saw a small increase in pain and stiffness and a decrease in the knee function the platelet rich plasma used in this clinical study has three times the platelet concentration than the normal blood these are the by giving the injection into the knee joint our study uh our study with the 387 patient with grade 1 and 2 osteoarthritis only uh, at this position i want to emphasize that technique is not not bad technician is bad and when we use the indication for our own extended indication then the results are definitely not as expected if it is used in grade 3 and grade 3 four uh, osteoarthritis definitely prp is going to do nothing so uh, i injected prp at the interval of 10 days for the three doses and one injection after the one month this was the protocol at the australia from where i got the training and in all cases there was much improvement in clinical presentation of pain in terms of duration intensity and pain in the night causing major distress swelling stiffness and range of the movement compression with the intraarticular steroid in 49 patient injection kenacort was given intraarticular at the interval of 1 month and 3 injections were given the effect of kenacort was studied and it was found that initially the pain was reduced and even the stiffness was also reduced but the effect vanished with the time and the patient had same symptom of pain and stiffness and in 7 patient there was no improvement and all of them were strongly ra positive early osteoarthritis knee are the most common painful uh, therapeutic painful orthopedic condition treated by the orthopedic physician and in this study to assess the role of prp injection treatment of the early osteoarthritis knee uh, this study started in 1960 to december 22 and all the patients were selected from grade 1 and grade 2 and in that the wong becker face pain scale was uh, measured then vas score were measured most of the patients were grade 2 to 5 or 
then the womac is four were included and the swelling uh, symptoms were swelling of the knee clicking of the knee catch and hang up the knee straightening of the knee bend of the knee pain and stiffness the experience of knee pain twisting pivoting of the knee straightening of the knee bending of the knee walking on flat surface night pain sitting or lying standing upright stiffness of the knee and lying in resting these are the all different and if you see the function in the daily living uh, so ascending the stairs descending the stair rising from sitting from standing bending to floor these are all different daily activity where patient they have problem with the uh, osteoarthritis so in our protocol the informed consent was taken sensitivity for the local and such is done or history taken whether patient has local anesthesia in past or not and if patient is on anticoagulant like aspirin and those drugs they are stopped for 3 days and all the anti inflammatory they stopped before uh, giving the prp for 3 to 5 days and patients were explained the procedure under the aseptic condition procedure started the 9 ml blood withdrawn in a sterilized anticoagulant tube of 10 ml with 1 ml citrate solution and the collected blood then centrifuged with 1000 rpm for 10 minutes from the centrifuge tube 8 ml prp was separated and again centrifuge for 3000 rpm for 10 minutes the collected prp then activated in photo activation machine for 15 minutes to activate the growth factors and in fully sterilized condition patient painted draped and injected injection given in the knee joint our protocol is three injection given weekly or 10 days interval and one injection given yearly prescription was given only for paracetamol 650 mg bd or tds sos quadriceps and hamstring exercises and no anti inflammatory drug patients were they were all uh, followed for 12 month at 1 3 6 and 12 month and results they were uh, quite good and in a study prp was significantly effective in reducing pain improvement in the function with range of movement in early grade 1 and 2 osteoarthritis of the knee now the lipolyzed platelet rich plasma is also available on a commercial basis there was one one study in the national institute of the health maryland usa that mri changes after the platelet plasma injection in knee osteoarthritis it was a randomized clinical trial and few paper has studied effectiveness of the prp on cartilage in this study we investigated the effective of the prp on cartilage corrected by mri consequencing the knee osteoarthritis in this study the addition in addition to effect of prp on was and womac score there was significant effect on radiological characteristic patello femoral cartilage volume and synovitis and for a further evaluation a long study with a large sample is recommended result was that it is seen that in the mri there was thickening at the uh, cartilage level at the end of the femur and when it is computerized the image was formed you can see the difference between the pre uh, before and after the prp the contraindications of the prp therapy the treatment with autologous prp is generally considered to be safe and hematological evaluation to rule out the potential coagulopathies and disorder of the platelet function patient who are anemic and those with thrombocytopenia may be unsuitable candidate for treatment with prp other potential contraindications they include hemodynamic instability severe hypovolemia unstable angina sepsis and anticoagulant or fibrinolytic drug therapy take home message the autologous prp is a relatively new biologically compound that has shown promise in this system stimulation and acceleration of the soft tissue and bone healing the efficacy of this treatment lies in the local delivery of a wide range of the growth factors and proteins mimicking the supporting physiological wound healing and reparative tissue process prp can be injected directly into the tendon which provides healing it's a low cost treatment and selection of the patient is very very important uh, this is a feedback from uh, i will just show you the two patients feedback she is a she is a international athlete and 
VRP treatment was started in 2015. And for last eight years, she is getting PRP very regularly. And she is doing very well in her field. She is a patient. She came today for the injection on a yearly basis. And Thank you. This was the uh, review of the patients regarding the PRP therapy. Thank you. Your mic is muted, sir. Dr. Sanjay, your mic is muted. Yes. Dr. Milind. You can, Dr. Sagal, you can stop sharing your screen. Dr. Milind, please. I am sharing my screen, sir. Yes. Everybody Sir, is it okay? Am I audible? Hello? There is echo from the... Sir, am I audible? Sir, you are running two screen. Just come to one screen, so the, otherwise there is echo. Sir, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Sir, can I share my screen now? Please. You can make it full screen. Right, sir. On it. So, a special thanks to uh, IOI committee and uh, Dr. Mangal Parihar for support and blessings. Sir, my topic that has been given to me is visco supplementation and where we stand today during uh, these uh, intra-articular injections and typically visco supplementation. So, uh, going moving forwards, uh, visco supplementation essentially, the visco supplement is basically a chemical with a high molecular weight, crossly high linked uh, 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 hyaluronic acid, which reduces cartilage breakdown and improves endogenous uh, hyaluronic acid production. So, hyaluronic acid is basically a natural. Uh, uh, immunity to shear forces and can alter biological properties of the joint. But uh, significantly, it plays no role in the mechanics. So, uh, what we long for in these uh, cases is an appropriate use criteria where uh, it has been said that it can be given in cases of early osteoarthritis and it delays total knee replacement surgery, where a few papers or literature supports that. Uh, in cases of severe osteoarthritis who are not willing for surgery, who are not fit for surgery, and who have uh, contraindicated NASAD use, uh, visco supplementation, steroids, and PRP may be an option. Third indication that has been given in uh, literature which uh, lacks substantial evidence is post arthroscopy debridement and young patients of early degenerative wear due to overuse. But do we actually have an appropriate use criteria in these cases of intraarticular injections? Because there is a large subset of population which is excluded because they have uh, a significant varus and varus valgus malalignment by the time that they present to us. And there are not many patients of grade 1 and grade 2 osteoarthritis who are actually willing for an intra-articular procedure. 
so starting with my uh, 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 the evidence i would present that osteoarthritis is actually a disease of mechanics the most important point that ramesh sir has also significantly highlighted that mechanics actually plays a vital role in this and altering biology may not be a very long term solution without side effects in cases plus in cases where uh, an economically weaker or maybe a developing nation is concerned where uh, every patient cannot afford a visco supplementation or maybe an intraarticular injection uh, this actually remains dubious and the role of exercises and primary management comes into play so i present a paper in from the indian uh, uh, authors where 78 expert orthopedic surgeons have given in two national meetings uh, appropriate criteria for diagnosis patient selection and follow up evaluation for knee osteoarthritis considering that in 2011 the disease burden osteoarthritis accounted for almost half of all the chronic conditions in age more than 65 years i samajh gaya lekin ashok bhi nahi mil rahe hain aur rishi chat kar rahe the wo bhi nahi mil rahe hain i don't know isliye maine aapko phone kar diya मैकेनिक्स प्ले बेसिक रोल and in these cases uh, there has been a lack of evidence and uh, this evidence uh, basically says that there are no structured guidelines for giving visco supplementation or uh, uh, cases where we can give uh, prp or steroids so so the next slide says that uh, in this same paper of visco supplementation what we long for is actually the criteria for patient selection uniformity predictability of how long can with the effect be follow up evaluation uh, uh, follow up evaluation with compliance and cost of injection which is included plus there is paucity of strong clinical evidence the regime is not defined and the adverse drug reactions and financial burdens are a concern sir so extended indications or same indications we are still unsure because in visco supplementations patients of kelgren lorenz grade 1 grade 2 osteoarthritis have been given uh, uh, visco supplementation and in these cases uh, there have been very unpredictable results the, the second uh, important criteria of visco supplementation says that grade 3 grade 4 oa which are not willing for surgery not fit for surgery and contraindicated use of uh, nasads can have visco supplementation it is not a primary line of treatment but what else can we do and the third subset of patient remains young patients who have sports injuries associated with minimal chondral lesions and chondropenia and who are basically overuse uh, athletes so uh, the next paper that was presented in bmj 2022 the supported ev supportive evidence of pereira et al sir am i audible yes uh, okay so uh, the supportive evidence says that there is a small reduction in knee osteoarthritis pain as compared with the placebo but the difference is less than minimally clinically important difference and there is an increased risk of serious adverse events as compared to placebo and these findings do not support broad use of visco supplementation so this is a 2022 paper sir where four major lessons have been drawn the first thing that i would like to uh, uh, relate is that original pma application was approved in august 8 1997 post which there were a lot of studies which uh, were on the visco, visco supplementation but and despite sufficient evidence uh, uh, which said that visco supplementation has no role there were a lot of studies which were done post 2009 also there were over 12000 patients who were subjected to intraarticular injections and nine large uh, randomized control studies were done and they were completed uh, after 2012 so the basic thing is that this uh, article tells us that 
visco supplementation is probably equal to or likely equal to placebo and higher side effects are seen based on the data from the same paper sir from medicare expenditure on visco supplementation treatment was expected to be about 325 million dollars in 2018 where 28% of it that was about 91 million dollars were was actually spent on treating large joint infections after visco supplementation injections so uh, as a developing country uh, where do we stand in this kind of a scenario is one doubt and a question also with this sir uh, we have we can uh, we have another uh, paper which mentions that in uh, visco supplementation early osteoarthritis patients have up to 14 weeks uh, of relief in pain but the, it doesn't really change any structural component of the cartilage composition and uh, there is no long term effect on the cartilage so basically it is more like a symptomatic relief and is temporary and has low effect no effect on long term prognosis so uh, now this uh, slide that i am presenting is how long can i expect the benefit of trivis to last so this is taken from an fda or uh, us fda website where the answer is very uncertain and it says that each patient reacts differently to trivis so it is not predictable three injections uh, given at weekly intervals can provide almost 12 uh, up to 12 weeks of pain relief and the duration may vary so we do not have an effect that is predictable we do not have a time duration that is predictable and looking at the financials of the developing country are we really ready for it sir, dr milind dr milind your slides are not moving sir is you it seeing okay? only we are seeing uh, one slide where viscom and supplementation for management of knee osteoarthritis from an indian perspective it has not moved from there i don't know whether it's my uh, in network issue it or is, is it no, like no, it is it's, not it is not moving okay okay sir let me look at it just a second sir but you can summarize just a second sir i am i am here sir just a second sir Dr. Milan, you are heard. You can summarize your talk or your concluding slide. You are not audible, Dr. Milan. you are not audible unmute your mic unmute your mic in the meantime if there are some questions on the intraarticular injections sir am i audible yes you are audible right sir so i am using another laptop here so i just need to use this now dr rastogi sir y yes uh, this is my opd time and one patient fracture patient is lying outside can i leave please thank you sir thank you sir i am sharing my screen uh, yes 
but you should present your concluding remarks right sir i am i'm just on it sir yes so uh, basically sir what uh, the conclusion is is uh, in the three things that we have actually seen one is osteoarthritis uh, the role of intraarticular injections one is corticosteroids another is prp and the third thing is visco supplementation so my take on this is since i have been given this topic the appropriate use criteria and the rational use criteria is actually missing and there have been a lot of studies regarding the same so platelet rich plasma has been a biological modality which has been in vogue and in favor like segel sir already has denoted leukocyte rich platelet rich plasma now is the most important and uh, uh, upcoming uh, uh, modality in sports persons along with visco supplementation corticosteroids basically have been a big no no in most of the recent publications where uh, corticosteroids have also led to an increased risk of joint infections post uh, replacement surgery and they have also been denoted to have uh, cause uh, the periarticular osteopenia in most of these cases and increased rate of complications post 3 to 6 injections of steroids sir role of visco supplementation is still unclear and since it forms a major financial burden on the economics and second thing the recent literature also does not have a full proof uh, uh, regarding the efficacy and the uh, uh, the time of uh, uh, relief the patient criteria is not still uh, confirmed the patients who are to be counseled regarding this uh intervention we cannot really do that appropriately since there is no predictability so the most important concern here is that visco supplementation also doesn't work in patients with mechanical malalignment who are most commonly presenting to the outpatient department in our country so very less patients who come in with grade 1 and grade 2 and also those who come in with grade 1 and grade 2 do not really want to be managed with interventions in the first or the second go and most of these patients actually improve with physical therapy as ramesh sir has already given thrown on light on so thank you so very much one has to be very judicious in intraarticular injections maybe only athletes sometime would require and be benefited now we move on to the next and we have success story of sto by dr krishn kumar uh, milan can you stop sharing screen please yeah milan Sir, I have stopped sharing the screen. Now it's no, it's 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 still it's still showing sharing screen. Okay, sir, just give me a second. Yeah, yeah, that's fine now. So thank you very much, uh, IOA, for giving me this opportunity. so i would be talking about the success story of high tibial osteotomy objective of this talk would be to uh, highlight on the factors contributing to the success of high tibial osteotomy with the advent of uh, joint replacement surgeries high tibial osteotomy uh, went to the back stage for probably a short period of time and uh, right now there is again a resurgence of uh, osteotomy treatment for osteoarthritis of the knee i would be highlighting on the literature review about the long term and the medium term success of high tibial osteotomy and along with a little bit of my personal experience with osteotomies i would start off with a case this is a 55 year old lady came with bilateral knee pain she was referred to me in 2012 and she was always already advised total knee replacement on the right side came for high tibial osteotomy on the left side she had bilateral varus knee full range of movement minimal fixed flexion deformity and all the conservative measures were exhausted now that's her full length x ray and clinical picture we did a high tibial osteotomy on the left side this is in 2012 that's her function after osteotomy 
that's her x-rays and finally she got her right knee replaced i happened to see her 11 years post high to be osteotomy and 7 years after her total knee replacement and this is what she had to tell my right knee that is the replaced knee is good but my left knee which is the osteotomy knee is much better so what was the reason for a successful realignment number 1 appropriate case selection and the second was adequate realignment so it all started in 1961 uh, with Jackson and Woh starting uh, doing an osteotomy on eight patients for uh, osteoarthritis knee. But most of the work in this field, early work was done by Coventry. In his initial paper, he emphasized the results at four years, which was satisfactory. Later in 1984, again, he published long-term results and, deterior and he said that the results deteriorated with time if the correction was inadequate. And if the correction was more than 10 degrees, that is 10 degrees of overcorrection, most of the patients did well. In 1993, he also added one more risk factor that is overweight and also the, the undercorrection. These are the two risk factors associated with failure of a high tibial osteotomy. So the problems with Coventry osteotomy was it was a supratubercle osteotomy. There was alteration of patellar biomechanics. Reproducibility was an issue. It worked well with Coventry, but many other authors found it difficult to get the same amount of success. And the pro there was a problem with the revision to knee replacement. When we consider the incidence and progression of osteoarthritis, the most important factor that decides the incidence as well as progression is alignment, which is measured on a full length weight bearing X-ray. When the knee is normal, 70% of the total weight is borne by the medial compartment. When it goes into varus, it becomes almost 97%. And when it is in valgus, four degrees of valgus, 50% is borne by each compartment. When you consider about compartment-specific osteoarthritis, malalignment is the most important factor in progression of the disease. So a lot of work has been done on alignment and osteoarthritis knee and all these papers, they say that malalignment is the most important factor leading to progression of the disease and deformity. So basically, it means that alignment is the key factor in the onset as well as the progression of knee osteoarthritis. And this was one paper in uh, 2001 published in JAMA, the role of knee alignment in disease progression and functional decline in osteoarthritis. And they say that in primary knee osteoarthritis, varus alignment at baseline increased the risk of subsequent progression of the arthritis and valgus alignment increased the risk of progression of lateral compartment arthritis. So again, it becomes a vicious cycle. When there is a little bit of varus, it leads to a medial compartment osteoarthritis. And when the medial compartment arthritis progresses, the deformity again increases. So it becomes a sort of a vicious circle. Success of HDO depends on realignment. And the question is how much to realign. And we know all know that it is three to six degrees of mechanical valgus or a hip knee angle, uh, angle of 183 to 186 degrees. So the indications for high tibial osteotomy are predominantly a unicompartmental disease. It need not be a pure unicompartmental disease, but a predominantly unicompartmental disease. The other remaining things like subluxation, body weight, age and range of movement, these were earlier considered to be contraindications, but now they are only relative contraindications. Age is a relative risk factor. There are papers which say that survival rates are more if the age is less than 50 years. But nowadays, majority of papers say that age is age independently as is not a risk factor. Functional outcome, you get the best results when the hip knee angle is 183 to 186 degrees. These are, Hernigo et al. had proved this and following that, multiple papers have come out with the same uh, findings. So the probability of survival for HDO at 5, 10, and 15 years in a paper by Catherine Huey is 95, 79, and 56% respectively. Medium and long-term results of high to be lost to be the functional outcome of high to be lost to be is progressing. And even this can be tried in patients with high degree of cartilage damage. Flocker Mayer in a, a very large series, that is a series of 533 knees, said that this can be attempted even in patients with a high degree of cartilage damage. So the question is, uh, here you see a patient with predominantly medial compartment arthritis, but if you watch closely, you can see that there is involvement of the uh, slight involvement of the lateral compartment also, but he's only 58 years and he's not willing for a TKR because the lifestyle modification required for a replaced knee, he is not willing to accept. So he was ready to take the so-called risk and that's his range of movement. He has full range of movement. And that's the follow-up. And this is how he was walking earlier 
before the surgery was being done you can see that there is a lateral thrust he walks with reasonable difficulty and after surgery he has a reasonable good gait and it's two years now since surgery and i'm keeping a close watch on this and he has a, a decent range of movement in both his knees so high tibial osteotomy is an option in a little bit of advanced disease also but that doesn't mean that it can be uh, the indications can be extended beyond a certain limit so the success depends on cartilage regeneration at the uh, at the knee joint so uh, as time progresses usually the result like probably for a year the patient keeps on feeling improvement after high tibial osteotomy the reason is this was proved by kushino in his arthroscopic study that after a high tibial osteotomy the cartilage is replaced the cartilage regenerates and it's a high quality fibrocartilage it's not a hyaline cartilage but it's a high quality fibrocartilage so that has been uh, uh, has been proved by other authors also so how much to correct 3 to 6 degrees of mechanical valgus anything more than 6 degrees might be a little bit of detrimental effect might have a little bit of detrimental effect hip knee ankle axis of 183 to 186 degrees and axis passing through the fujisawa point fujisawa point is basically the lateral border of the lateral tibial spine <laughs> And the most important part is you get an adequate correction, but along with that, you, you should be able to maintain the correction. So how much to realign? Hernigo again has proved that the best results happen when it is 183 to 186 degrees and there is no disease progression in this knees. More than 186 degrees correction sometimes leads to a progressive lateral compartment osteoarthritis. Accuracy of cartil correction cartilage regeneration. The relationship was proved by Fujisawa. He said that mechanical axis passed through a point 30 to 40 percent lateral to the midpoint. The ulcerated region regenerates, surviving it regenerates from the surviving cartilage along the border. And about one to one and a half to two years after osteotomy, the ultra ulcerated region was thoroughly covered with fibrous and membranous tissue. So cartilage regeneration is not a myth, it happens. So that is one of the edges that a fixator assisted realignment compared to other procedure has because the accuracy of correction can be perfect because it allows you adjustability in the post-operative period. So outcome and cartilage regeneration depends on accuracy and that is four to six degrees of valgus. So the planning is the key to successful realignment. The success always depends on your planning. You plan with help of soft spot films and full length radiographs. Calculate the mechanical axis deviation and also the varus. LDFA, MPTA, and join line congruity also. Find out the apex of the deformity. And this is how you plan. The axis passes through the prospective proximal axis, which is passing through the Fujisawa point. The distal axis is pro projected from the ankle. You calculate the correction, and this is how the final correction is. So that's your planning. Level of osteotomy. There is something called an alakata approach for realignment. So every uh, varus is not, not treated in the same way, and every valgus is not treated in the same manner. You see three cases here. The first one is a varus medial compartment. All the three cases, in fact, are medial compartment arthritis. And this is how the deformity looks like. So number one, it's the tibia. Second case, it's the femur. And the third is both the femur and the tibia. So the level of osteotomy is tibia in the first case. In the femur, it's diaphyseal femur, actually distal diaphysis. And the third one is distal femur and proximal tibia. So femoral osteotomy, you can add a fem They never hesitate to add a femoral osteotomy if required. We do it when the LDFA is more than 90 degrees and especially when the patient has a lateral thrust on walking, that doing a femoral, additional femoral osteotomy helps to avoid the joint line obliquity. You can correct the femur up to an LDFA of 85 degrees. You can see that this lady has a lateral thrust while she is walking. We did both her tibia and femur and once the correction was done, her thrust is completely gone and she is walking comfortably. So uh, the rationale for femoral osteotomy is poor clinical outcomes were more evident in excessive MPTA. If it is more than 95, that is overcorrection of, of tibia itself is detrimental. Lateral compartment pain was experienced significantly frequently in the patient who had a significantly increased MPTA following an osteotomy. But there are papers against that, that you can have an oblique joint line, but still the functional results are good. But for as far as we are concerned, we still prefer to osteotomize the femur wherever required. Yeah. Opening versus a closing with osteotomy. The functional results in most of the series, uh, comparing opening as well as closing with osteotomy, are comparable, provided the correction is adequate. 
Now, a word about fixator high table osteotomy. This is what I usually prefer to do. You get accurate correction because you have the uh, possibility of correcting it in the post-operative period. You get the you have the option of taking the full length weight bearing X-rays also. Post-operative adjustability is there, and there is no change in the tibial slope or patellar biomechanics when you are doing a uh, osteotomy distal to the tuberosity. And maintenance of correction with time is not an issue because you are using the principle of distraction osteogenesis, and more mature bone is being created and gets. We get excellent, ex excellent functional results, and we have papers from our own country uh, highlighting these factors. And less blood loss, negligible soft tissue dissection, better healing potential because you are using the principle of distraction or osteogenesis, and there is no there is no interference with future TKR. Patient is fully functional from the fourth week of surgery. So to conclude, the parent knee is always better than prosthetic knee. Realignment osteotomies are to be done to prevent or at least delay knee replacement and the aim is to provide a functional and pain-free knee which in turn uh, rely on accuracy of correction. So alignment maintenance is the most important thing when you take the feature, the factor of long-term results in a, in a, in a high tibial osteotomy and fixators and lock plates have a slight edge over other methods of fixation when you uh, think in terms of maintaining the alignment. So every patient is to be considered as a candidate for future TKR, but the procedure should not create problems for the arthroplasty surgeon. So these are the factors that needs to be thought of when, when you uh, consider the success story of high tibial osteotomy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Now, if there are any questions. Uh, can I ask a question, sir? Please. Uh, I want to ask a question that how long do you keep external fixator? How many weeks? Uh, for me, it's uh, I, I use these type of dynamic external fixators when uh, I'm, I'm dealing with a deformity which is less than say uh, 20 degrees, not for not not more than 20 degrees. So these fixators are usually retained average, I would say three and a half months, but there were situations where I have removed fixator at three months. And also there are situations where the healing has been slightly delayed, especially when doing these older patients, where I had to retain the fixator for five months. Okay. And second thing, uh, do you have encountered any loss of correction after removal of fixator? That is what uh, common complications many of the surgeons are facing. Uh, we remove the fixator. We, we uh, remove the fixator uh, only once uh, we are sure that there is no collapse. So uh, once we see good healing on X-rays, and when the patient is fully weight bearing, we loosen the fixator and make them do a trial walking, lock the fixator again, and send them home. Call them back again. Do once do the trial walking once more, and then only if there is collapse more than 2 mm, we retain the fixator for some more time. But if the collapse is less than 2 mm, we remove the fixator. Uh, I have follow-ups for 12 years now. Uh, none of them has encountered a loss of correction. Yes, one patient has a, a varus, but th that was purely my mistake. That was my second case. And I did some readjustment and did not take a full-length X-ray after readjustment. I believed on eyeballing, uh, which was wrong from my part. Her high tibial osteotomy, her, her, her uh, surgery has failed. That, that was not because of the fixator part. That was only because of my calculation error. Okay. Hi, Krishna. Can I put a question to you? Yeah. So how do you basically counsel the patient for the predictability of the time duration that they might have before they get into a knee replacement or can they really escape a knee replacement with an HTO? Uh, I never say that they can escape a, a, a replacement with an HDO. So what, what we usually uh, tell the patients is, uh, in my hands, this has worked for a period of, say, 12 to 13 years. That is the longest follow-up I am having. And of course, in the, in the, uh, the center where I am trained, that is uh, with Dr. Mangal, uh, I have seen patients with much more longer follow-up period. So I try to counsel them with all these uh, factors, uh, tell them that this is not a substitute for re knee replacement. You might need a re replacement in future. This has worked good in my hands. So I would definitely try to get the alignment corrected and you should get, you should get pain relief as well as return to activities without much of a trouble. There are of course patients who uh, Go, the, most of them sh comes to me after uh, shopping at least two or three places where replacement was advised. Uh, a certain uh, percentage of people stay back with me and I try to show them my results. I, I show them usually the videos and all those things and many gets convinced and 
uh, do the surgery i'm not able i'm i'm i would say i'm not able to convince 100% of patients who come to me probably 20 30% gets convinced to hydrobil osteotomy because the push for arthroplasty is that much uh, one more okay, question yeah, thank you one more question uh, have you uh, seen any scientific reports or scientific uh, results that uh, after shifting the weight bearing force in the lateral compartment and lateral compartment gets degenerated i have never encountered that thing uh over correction leads to uh, lateral compartment pain that is that is uh, one paper which I, i i read this only when i was preparing for this particular talk uh that that i had shown in my uh, presentation also uh, i can put that in the group if required the only thing that they say is there is a increased incidence of lateral compartment pain no pay i didn't encounter any paper which said that lateral compartment degeneration increased because uh, most of the papers uh, mentioned that the reason for failure is either recurrence of varus or under correction yes. under correction yes. and recurrence if we have yes. realigned very well and uh, then if as you said between 3 to 6 degree valgus yes then, uh, it works very long and none of the paper says that it degenerates lateral compartment cartilage yes yes uh, no paper i have seen i haven't seen mm-hmm. a paper which says that failure due to lateral compartment arthritis can i add something no. yes sir see this question was asked to dr koshino in a conference in delhi that uh, will lateral compartment osteoarthritis occur when you do hto by any method the answer he gave was that it took 50 years for medial compartment to degenerate and it will take another 50 years for lateral compartment to degenerate so by that time the patient would have lived his whole life yeah yeah that question i have had dr ravi mitra i remember that <laughs> i asked to cosino in the uh, apoa conference okay so uh, i think that's quite uh, we should learn from other experience also Uh, when we are thinking about this problem that none of the our pioneers who, who are doing this surgery for a very long time they had this problem and of course if we do a preservation surgery it gives us many years and which is so very important so if there are no further questions we move on to the next and i'll request dr thakka to tell us about the types of osteotomies around the knee yes sir i will start sharing now can you show the full full screen sharing screen is visible to all yes okay thanks for giving opportunity to deliver a talk on types of osteotomy around knee and uh, uh, very nice program arranged by dr rastogi and uh, if we uh, see uh, if we talk about types of osteotomy around knee that means Uh, the osteotomy in the proximal tibia either in the distal femur or it can be combined both femur uh, and tibia so how we will decide where to operate uh, as dr krishna kumar has already mentioned uh, that uh, we have to correct we should try to correct the deformity where it is uh, where uh, from where it is generating for that we must understand the basic angles of the femur distal femur and proximal tibia so uh, i will mention about the important angles only uh, if we see that mechanical uh, if we see there is anatomical left- sir your slides are not seen okay i think i i stop sharing and then again yes yeah
now can you see yes yeah uh, anatomical lateral distal femoral angle is uh, 81 degree plus or minus 2 and uh, that is normally we can remember 81 degree anatomical femorotibial angle should be 173 to 175 degree that is the normal value anatomical medial proximal tibial angle is 87 degree and uh, this is not important but we have to finish that anatomical lateral distal tibial angle is 89 degree and uh, if we think that was anatomical angles now if we see the mechanical axis then mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is 87 sorry these arrows showing wrong thing uh, it's uh, somewhere here and mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is 87 mechanical medial tibial angle is also 87 so mechanical and anatomical angles remain same for the tibia and uh, again mechanical lateral distal tibial angle that also remains same and is 89 degree so before that we have to perform the mal mechanical axis deviation that is what we can say mal alignment test uh, when there is a varus deformity we have to measure the angle if mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is 87 degree more than 87 degree then it is a femoral varus deformity when there is a mechanical proximal tibial angle is less than 87 then it is a tps tibial varus deformity and we should correct it in the tibia if it is in the femoral varus then we should correct in the femur and the same thing for the valgus if we are examining the valgus knee and if we are measuring the angles uh, uh, for the valgus knee and if there is mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is less than 87 then there is a femoral valgus deformity and if uh, mpta mechanical mpta is more than 87 then it's in the tibial valgus deformity where we should many times we encounter that both the bones are de uh, deformed then we should correct in both the sides so if we uh, see uh, the types of osteotomy around knee our aim uh, already previous speakers has told that aim of osteotomy is to shift the weight bearing axis in the healthier compartment that is uh, fuji sava near the fuji sava point no yeah, idea we should remember that we should not do much over correction also and there are uh, if we consider in the proximal tibia there are two types of osteotomy is uh, described one is arch type that is what we call is a dome osteotomy dome osteotomy with a concavity upwards and uh, is also described and one is the concavity downwards so all these arch type of uh, osteotomies was described by uh, and was fixed with the uh, elizer or external fixator so uh, for correction we need some external fixator in arch type of uh, osteotomy and uh, uh, dr milin chaudhary has also described one osteotomy where uh, fixator assisted uh, internal fixes a fixator assisted uh, dome osteotomy and another is a wedge type osteotomy uh, wedge type can be of two open wedge and closed wedge uh, open wedge we all are aware about and is very popular in a present era open wedge can be of uh, three types one is uniplanar another is biplanar and third one is tpl condylar valgus osteotomy that is what we call as a TCBO, all three is very popular in present time and open wedge uh, has their own limitations each osteotomy has their own limitations and another closed wedge is uh, practicing since more than uh, 50 years that is a uh, closed wedge supratuberosity that uh, popularly known as commentary osteotomy and even closed wedge osteotomy uh, infratuberosity that very commonly i am choosing the infratuberosity uh, closed wedge osteotomy and this osteotomy can be the distal femur distal femur also uh, that can be open wedge or closed wedge open wedge again can be uniplanar or biplanar like that now we will see each uh, type of osteotomy with their uh, limitations also this is a one type of arch which i said that with concavity downwards and uh, it has to be corrected that and this uh, we can on table we can check correction by uh, uh, I think court report test or like that and here we can see that uh, this concavity is upwards so this is uh, I think become not very popular because probably maybe the reasons I have not practiced this osteotomy anytime so I cannot comment much about this but there must be some technical issues or some 
uh, expert skills may be required. This has not been replicated uh, by many, uh, most of the surgeons. Few are still, may, might have continued doing arch type of osteotomy, uh, but uh, it's not very popular. Now, in open wedge of osteotomy, that is very popular. And uh, before that, we have to plan how much degree we should open. The Miniaki method is a very common method and very particular method for uh, preoperative planning. Here is shortly, I will show the Miniaki method. The first, we have to draw the mechanical line. Then we should draw a line. One represents the plan weight bearing la uh, line. And uh, that uh, we, uh, this plan weight bearing line passing through near the Fujisawa point. And then line two, that is, uh, it connects the hinge point that is a superior tibia fibular joint for the open wedge and that hinge point to the center of the ankle joint and line three that connects the osteotomy hinge point to the arc of intersection of line one. So this is our correction angle. That is what we have uh, measured this alpha angle that is to be corrected. Then we can put a cut here. One cut is required uh, for a uniplanar. For biplanar, it's uh, another issues. And after cutting this, we have to, this much angle, we should open. And this is how it is open. And the weight bearing axis has been corrected. So the open wedge has uh, many advantages. One thing is technically uh, relatively simple as compared to close wedge. Only one cut is required. And another thing, fibula does not require any intervention. Uh, these are the advantages. But disadvantages is that there is a... Uh, we cannot correct more than few degrees safely. Uh, it has been described up to the 20 degree correction, but it uh, because two surfaces, two bone surfaces are not in contact with each other. So it takes a little longer time to unite as compared to close wedge. These are some limitations and uh, this open wedge can be fixed with either external fixator or can be fixed with the internal fixator like Tomo fix, Pudu plate and various other uh, Otis plate and various types of plate has been described. So this is all about the uniplanar open wedge. And this is the one example of open wedge. Uh, here we can see open. Some may put bone graft. There is again a debatable that whether we should put bone graft or not. And this is one example which I have operated. This is the pre-operative and post-operative after correction of that is a uniplanar uh, high tibial osteotomy in fixed with the tomofix. This is biplanar uh, high tibial osteotomy. So biplanar, uh, that means the osteotomy is done in the two planes. This is one vertical plane and this is horizontal plane. And after that uh, vertical, this bone remains in contact with each other. So it has also it advantages. Advantages are that the vertical remains in touch with the bone. So it unites very early as compared to uniplanar. And uh, this advantage is that, that it uh, technically becomes long procedure and uh, it, uh, it creates some problem of fracture of tibial tuberosity or like that. So the all procedures have their own advantages and disadvantages. And now uh, another open wedge. Many surgeons uh, now have started tibial condylar valgus osteotomy in which the medial femoral condyle is osteotomized and is open like this here we can see and then is either fixed with the external fixator may, most of the time it is fixed with the internal fixation advantage is, is that it uh, uh, regains the congruity of the joint knee joint and then uh, uh, another thing uh, is uh, it has a limitations that it corrects uh, uh, it cannot correct larger deformities and uh, probably I have not done any TCVO, but uh, I think it must be technically difficult also. So these are the disadvantage and close wedge method. Now, uh, preoperative planning remains same for the close wedge as uh, we have seen in the open wedge. The hinge point will be different. Here is the same thing, but the hinge point remains on the medial side. That is the concave con Convex, concave convex surface of the proximal tibia. That is the hinge point. And after uh, this much angle has been measured, here we have to remove the wedge like this. And then after removing the wedge, it has to be closed like this. So it has an advantage that uh, uh, 
uh, both the uh, proximal and distal surface of the osteotomy remains in contact with each other. And uh, another uh, advantage is that uh, it unites very fast as compared to open wedge. Uh, but disadvantages are there that it requires some intervention in the fibula, either fibular osteotomy or so we may have to do something to the superior tibia fibular joint. And then, uh, uh, and second thing, uh, what happens uh, as Dr. Krishna Kumar has said that if we perform a Coventry osteotomy, probably uh, knee replacement surgeons uh, face that it may become difficult uh, to do knee replacement if it requires in future. So these are the disadvantage of close wedge. Close wedge, as I said, it can be a Coventry. We can see it's very uh, longest uh, duration has been uh, about the Coventry first became very popular even before total knee replacement era. And uh, Coventry also can give excellent results if it is done perfectly. Because here we can see that there was a, this was, was uh, after 20 years follow up of that patient particularly it was operated very senior orthopedic surgeon of Hamdavad, Dr. Prabodem Desai and his son came to me to have an osteotomy. So I took the x-rays of his father. He was operated by Dr. Prabod Desai and even at the end of 27 years this was the picture and he was walking without any pain and he had a full function. So it has a good results but Coventry has a lot of disadvantages. Which disadvantages? One thing the osteotomy is performed above the tibial tuberosity. So there is a very limited space available. So more than 15 degree virus cannot be corrected. Another thing, flexion deformity more than 10 degree is not possible to correct. And a third thing is fixation problem. Nowadays in present era, plaster for more than six weeks is not tolerated by patient. And even plaster cannot maintain the correction what we have achieved on table. So these are the disadvantages. So most of the cases were going into the virus again and failure of the high tibial osteotomy in Coventry. So it becomes uh, uh, Coventry osteotomy has lost their importance in a, uh, and then total knee replacement came into the picture. So uh, nowadays, uh, Dr. Maheshwari from Gujarat, Jamnagar has, uh, has uh, made one plate to fix the Coventry osteotomy very nicely. Uh, but the long-term follow-up is still we are awaiting. And uh, the another osteo infratubri, you know, tuberosity close wedge osteotomy, that is very, I am fan of doing the infratuberosity close wedge osteotomy is done at the level of uh, just below the uh, attachment of patellar tendon at the uh, tuberosity. And then apex is in the metaphysis, base is in the diaphysis. And this is one patient which I have operated. The weight bearing axis is very well corrected and shifted near the Fujisawa, uh, Fujisawa point. And here we can see that the uh, patient can have a full function after high tibial osteotomy. All osteotomies can get this kind of uh, good results, excellent results, not only this close wedge, but uh, uh, if we do perfect, the aim is to correct the weight bearing, uh, is to shift the weight bearing axis near the Fujisawa point. That is the uh, a main key of success of the any of the high tibial osteotomy, either open wedge or close wedge. Uh, here, uh, now, we, if we uh, see, there is a distal femoral osteotomy. This is a 65-year-old lady suffering from uh, her knee pain on the on the both side, but she came, pain was more on the right side. So, here we can see that there is a lateral compartment arthritis. So, here we have to perform the uh, malalignment test. And if we see that LDFA is lateral distal femoral angle is 75, normal value is uh, 81 degree. So all the deformity, most of the deformity is in the femur. MPTA is also 90 degree, is more than 10, uh, uh, is normal value is 87 plus or minus 3 degree. So here the most of the deformity lies in the femur. So in this particular position, valgus should be corrected in the femur. And this is how uh, Miniaki method uh, is also described for the, to correct the uh, femoral deformity. And here uh, uh, we have to correct, uh, consider like this. Here is the plan weight bearing axis of the center of the femur, uh, femoral head at present it is here. Our plan is to shift the center of femoral head here. And this is the hinge point. So this is the angle of correction what we should correct it came 17 degree 17 degree in uh, this particular patient we can remove the wedge 
from the medial side like this, 17 degree wage has been removed and is fixed uh, after closure of the wage is fixed with the medial femoral locking plate like this. And if we see the pre-operative uh, weight bearing axis and post-operative weight bearing axis, the uh, weight bearing line is passing from the medial uh, tibial spine. I achieved little less than expected, but still patient is happy and uh, is pain free. But uh, ideally, it should be. I think ideally, we should achieve little more correction. Uh, lateral open wedge to correct the valgus deformity has also been described. That is also we did in one patient, and uh, around ten degree of the correction we achieved. We put a bone graft and fixed with plate like this. But medial open wedge uh, of the distal fem, uh, sorry, lateral open wedge for the distal femur again has the same disadvantages what that the bone context uh, is not in contact with each other bone surface is not con in contact with each other so it may take little longer time to unite so uh, even virus deformity also uh, can be in the femur or it is not all the time in the tibia and valgus deformity is not all the time in the femur so here is there is a uh, again a method miniaki method to measure the virus deformity in the femur. This is just uh, a case which I am showing, uh, just example I am showing. Here we can see that uh, virus is in the femur because LDFH, lateral distal femoral angle is 98 degree. The normal value, normal value is uh, 81. So all the deformities is in the femur and MPTA is 88. So it's near normal because M normal value of MPTA is 87 degree. And, uh, here we should correct in the distal femur. So uh, close wedge osteotomy in the distal femur, lateral base close wedge osteotomy in the distal femur is like this. And we can correct the deformity like this. So all uh, these are the femoral osteotomies what in the distal femur to correct the either varus or valgus deformity. And here we can see the clinical picture also about correction of the distal uh, varus deformity in the distal femur. So one more patient combined HTO. Many times it requires combined high tibial osteotomy and distal femoral osteotomy also. Here, uh, if we see here, there is a difference. This is non weight bearing excellent. This is weight bearing excess. There is opening of lateral joint space uh, on weight bearing. So, uh, actual deformity is in the 10, 10 degrees. So, all the pre operative planning, what we should do is non weight bearing full length x ray. And then we should correct the deformity. Here we can see in non weight bearing x ray, LDFA is 87, the normal value is 81. MPTA is 83, normal value is 87. So deformity is in the both. Femur value is eight, uh, 81, normal value has been uh, increased up to 87. So six degree virus uh, in the femur and uh, four degree virus in the tibia. So uh, we should correct on the both side. So in tibia, uh, six, uh, we have to do some over correction also. So what I planned was that eight degree correction was planned in the femur and eight degree correction was in the tibia. Our aim was to achieve over correction four to six degrees. So here was the plan. Uh, after doing tibial osteotomy, I again take a full length X-ray and then uh, I see that uh, the, the tibia was corrected less than as planned. So the eight degree planning was converted into 10 degree uh, correction in the distal femur and then after both distal femoral osteotomy and proximal tibial osteotomy that is a close wedge uh, both the close wedge distal femur and proximal tibia and this is how we have shifted the weight bearing axis near the Fujisawa point so the same thing can be done with the this open wedge proximal tibial osteotomy this is weight bearing x-ray of the same patient with both the close wedge uh, here we can see that there is no opening of uh, lateral joint space on the weight bearing that was there previously. And uh, this is uh, again a combined osteotomy. Here we can see after doing high tibial osteotomy, little uh, correction, even more correction is required. And then we did the lateral base close wedge osteotomy in the distal femur. And this is the double uh, osteotomy. And we have shifted the weight bearing axis uh, satisfactorily in the near the Fujisawa point. So these are the various kind of osteotomies and even there are many other methods has also been described, but uh, most of the routinely practiced osteotomies which I have shown already to you. Thank you for uh, kind attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thakkar.
So if there are any questions. Now, just one question. Uh, have you ever found like uh, you have been doing plates in majority of cases, right? Yes, yes. So once you have did it and take a weight bearing X-ray and you see that there is a slight over or under correction, what, what is the percentage of patients in which you have experienced that? Because you don't have the option of uh, taking a weight bearing X-ray uh, when you're doing a plate, right? No, uh, not weight bearing X-ray. Uh, it's a good question. When I was, I am doing a, a HTO since more than uh, 20 years. So initially, uh, I was not uh, taking any pre, uh, thing per operate during surgery that whether it is overcorrected or undercorrected. So this problem I face in the initial phase, but at present, in every patient during surgery, I take a X-ray. Even I don't rely on the IITV images. Also, I take a X-ray in fourteen by seventeen cassette, and then I measure the MPTA, right? MPTA on table. On table, I measure the MPTA. Suppose I have uh, targeted the MPTA that is 87, I want to bring it to the 94, then I will measure on table that MPTA has come to the 94, which I want. Then I fix it permanently. Otherwise, it's a temporary fixation. So, in okay, so before way, before plating, you uh, take the X-ray? like uh, before, you... With temporary fixation. But... Either one, one or two screw in the proximal fragment and one or two screw in the late distal fragment. And then I take X-ray. And then is X-ray, I satisfied with the X-ray, either it is not overcorrected or not undercorrected, then and then I do permanent fixes. And that is the only thing what we can I do. Because as you said, once I come out of the theater, I can't do anything. Dr. Thakkar, when you have to do a both femoral and tibial, you do in one sitting or sequentially? Uh, uh, I have shown the two patients. Uh, some most of the time, if it is planned, then uh, I try to do in both. And on table, I take full length X ray to check that whether we check exactly one recovery. sitting. Yeah, one sitting. Only one patient I have operated in two sittings. Other patients, most of the patients are all almost all the patients are operated in one sitting only. But I take after doing one osteotomy, either uh, first I do in the tibia, then I take full length x-ray before starting in the femur. So suppose I have done a little bit under correction in the tibia, so I can compensate in the distal femur. So in, uh, in theater, how do you take full length x-ray? Uh, full length x-ray, we have a portable machine and the uh, operation theater table is, uh, uh, we make it maximum down, maximum down. And we have a cassette, very long cassette that uh, contains three uh, grid and then uh, we put uh, below and then I, we do painting and wrapping again okay, as we, it is, we are doing in two surgeries. On table we can manage to take uh, not as perfect as in the department but we can manage to measure uh, the angles. One thing I would like to add is uh, like one of the advantages that we have felt while uh, doing a, a distal femur osteotomy with a plate and tibial osteotomy with a fixator is that we can do that in one sitting itself because yeah. uh, we finish off the femur and if at all a couple of degrees of here and there that can be adjusted in the tibia because uh, you are starting the distraction at a later stage. That is that is one slight advantage when you are uh, doing a fixator. In a fixator has a many advantages, I think. Yes. Fixator has no, a when, you're, when you're doing a dual osteotomy, dual uh, osteotomy. That is that is one slight thing that we have right. felt. To be a even slightly... even doing a single osteotomy in the tibia, then yes. also it has a many advantages. But only disadvantages is a compliance of the patient. That is the only thing. Obviously, there is some disadvantages of external fixator because patient cannot take bath uh, as a fixator is on. And another thing uh, uh, is that during night hours. If they want to turn in the bed, that is what patient has already described to me that what problems they are facing with the fixator for three months. And if they want to turn in the bed, then also it creates a little bit problems. So all these uh, routine problems of fixator is that. But uh, I would say scientifically, most perfect method is a fixator assisted uh, high level osteotomy. But the, at the same time, patient should be ready for the this inconvenience for three to three and a half months. 
you must you have done many with fixators so you have a better uh, if any yes, other... one thing one thing that uh, we allow the patient to take bath daily uh, we, we allow them to wash the fixator daily that is that is one thing that we routinely do uh, number mm -hmm. two the problem of uh, turning around in the bed yes it's there because there is something extra on your leg uh, which which many doesn't feel comfortable that, that's that's definitely there and yes. there is a one fear of uh some uh, direct heat to the fixator to the patients that is very small small things but still uh, because this era is of instant result every patient wants uh, that is uh, the only drawback of external fixator otherwise uh, technically uh, the fixator is the best method uh, to do corrective osteotomy I think we finished in very well in time. Yes. There is uh, one question from Dr. Sinha. Uh, the role of cosmetic limb lengthening surgery. I think uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar Elizaro. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, to be very frank, if a patient comes for a cosmetic lengthening, if it's proportionate, uh, I would say, uh, I would try to, uh, uh, what you say, uh, tell them that surgery is not needed. It has got its own issues. Uh, almost 100% cosmetic lengthenings that has come to me, I have uh, I've been able to counsel them properly and send them back uh, without having surgeries. If it's, yes, I have done lengthenings for a chondroplasia patients. Uh, that that is altogether a different ball game because there you have adequate amount of muscles. The soft tissues are tuned to their original length, so lengthening is not a big thing there. But if you are proportionate, I would say cosmetic lengthening is not something which needs to be promoted because it has got. I have seen patients with who had peroneal nerve palsy who had joint contractures and stiffness after cosmetic lengthening because the soft tissues in their body are tuned to their actual length, so we are trying to stretch it too much. So, my take is no for a cosmetic length. If you are proportionate. Uh, is Dr. Mangal Parihar is with us? Dr. Mangal Parihar can answer this. So, appears he is not there. So, we have uh, finished well in time. And I thank all these speakers who have agreed to and given um, their views to enlighten us. And I thank all of you and all the viewers who have joined this program. And this second webinar we'll plan later and we'll let you know the dates and details, which will be demonstrating various techniques in more detail. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. Mr. Rishi. Dr. Rishi, Dr. Hoda, Dr. Rizlani. Thank you very much if you are around. I think we have to call him because uh, stop recording particularly. Ah, yes. You have Dr. Uh, Rishi's number? No, I don't have. I have Rishlani's number. Mm -hmm. huh. uh, we, we have finished. There's nobody to stop recording and take our thanks Aja, and I thank you for all your help and share Mr. Rishi's number to me for future use. Thank you. So as we exit, things will close down. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, everybody.